right. Okay. Recording is now enabled. Uh, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Juanita Majet Spence. As Director of Library Services here at Elizabeth City State University, it is my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to you as this year's National Library Week theme is Welcome to Your Library, which is very fitting for today. And it promotes the idea that libraries extend far beyond the four walls of a building and that everyone is welcome to use their services. I am your moderator for today. Today's session will be recorded. Chat will be monitored by David Dusto, Electronic Resources Librarian here at Elizabeth City State University. Please feel free to provide your questions during the session. Links to library resources and a library live guide will also be shared with you via chat as well. As we celebrate National Library Week, the GR Little Library continues the excitement of moving back into our newly renovated library space. We look forward to inviting faculty, staff, students, and friends very soon for the grand opening. Today's presentation will center on the Rosenwald program and how it impacts education for Southern African American children in the 20th century. Presenters for today will include Nyla Harris, who is a student here at Elizabeth City State University. Nyla will introduce herself and give brief remarks of her knowledge regarding Rosenwald schools. Other presenters include Dr. Melissa Stuckey, Assistant Professor, Social, uh, Behavior, Social and Behavioral Sciences at ECSU. Leah Banks, library technician, will introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Aisha Johnson. Dr. Johnson will discuss her amazing contribution to library and information science field. We are very honored to have her with us today. Thank you so very much. Nyla, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Spence, for that beautiful introduction. Um, as Dr. Spence stated, I am Nyla Harris, a senior, and I am majoring in biology, and I will be graduating this May, so that's super exciting. Um, just for myself, all I can say is I really love the library, and I'm really honored to be a part of this presentation today. The Rosenwald School Program was an important avenue to education for Southern African American children in the first half of the 20th century. The program was created by Julius Rosenwald, a Northern philanthropist best known for his Sears stores and the famous African American educator, Booker T. Washington. Between 1913 and 1932, 4,997 Rosenwald schools were constructed, constructed in 14 Southern states. By the end of the program, North Carolina had 813 Rosenwald school buildings and related facilities, more than any other state. Further, about 25% of North Carolina's Rosenwald schools were located in Northeastern North Carolina. As an ECSU student, it was truly exciting to me to learn that one of these Rosenwald schools was located right here on my campus. Even more exciting, it is a building that I'm very familiar with as an ROTC cadet, because until just two years ago, it was home to ECSU's ROTC program. Interesting enough, I was first introduced to the impact of the Rosenwald School at the age of seven when my paternal grandmother informed me of her attendance to the school located in South Mills, North Carolina. So I've actually seen the building <laughs> and it still stands right next to her home today. Also, I wanted to add how excited I'm a part, to, excited I am to be a part of this uh, National Library Week event. It's just it's awesome to honor our libraries because sometimes we just see them as like a place that stores books, like Dr. Spence says. But there's so many more resources that we don't know about. So thank you for inviting me again. And on behalf of the students here at ECSU, I can honestly say that we are very excited to experience the newly renovated GR Little Library in fall 2021. 
And I'm proud to say that I was a part of the first group to volunteer unpacking equipment there last week. So that was super awesome. Dr. Melissa Stuckey, Assistant Professor of African American History at Elizabeth City State University, is leading the rehabilitation efforts for ECSU's campus Rosenwald School Building. In addition to this work, she is completing a book about all black towns in Oklahoma and serves as a researcher in the Beaufort County, South Carolina Low Country National Reconstruction History Center project. Dr. Stuckey will now give a brief update on the status of the ECSU Rosenwald School Rehabilitation Project. Dr. Stuckey. Thank you so much, Nyla. Um, I loved hearing that your grandmother went to the Rosenwald School in South Mills. Um, learning things like that um, is exactly why I was excited to, for the opportunity to speak on uh, before uh, Dr. Johnson. So I think, thank you so much, Dr. Spence and the hardworking librarians uh, at ECSU for allowing me this opportunity. Uh, let me just get started because I definitely don't wanna take up uh, much time in this conversation. Since roughly 2016, various members of ECSU's faculty and administration have been cultivating a dream to collect, preserve, protect, and interpret elements of the university's material and archival history and elements of the same in its affiliated communities through a long-term project to rehabilitate and repurpose two historic campus buildings, a three-teacher Rosenwald School constructed in 1921, and the university's original principal's house, constructed in 1923. The dream was first conceived by the late Dr. Thomas Conway, 12th chief executive at ECSU, who, having attended a Rosenwald school himself in Lewisburg, North Carolina, where his parents also taught, immediately recognized the intrinsic historical value of the Rosenwald school on our campus and foresaw what its rebirth could mean to the region. For this reason, with his blessing, a group convened to develop a concept for the two buildings I will elaborate upon shortly. And in 2018, this group began applying for grant funding to support the concept and to date have been awarded grants from major federal agencies, including the National Park Service and the Institute for Museum and Library Services uh, to support this dream. We are thankful to our current university chancellor, Dr. Carrie Dixon, and the senior members of her administration for their continued support in this endeavor. Using current grant funds and anticipated future awards over the coming years, we hope to create within our Rosenwald School and Principal's House, a facility that we are currently referring to as the Northeastern North Carolina African American Research and Cultural Heritage Institute. Within this unique and much needed regional institution, we intend to one, preserve and display artifacts representing the university's heritage as a teacher training institution. Two, identify, acquire, preserve and display additional related artifacts located within our constituent communities like in South Mills, um, specifically our Rosenwald alumni communities. Digitize, select archival materials to expand their accessibility. Four, collect oral histories from all of our affiliated communities. And five, create a gathering place for the exploration, interpretation of the interrelated histories of the university, our Rosenwald school, our local community, and the communities within which our graduates served as teachers many of them teaching in Rosenwald schools in the region and across North Carolina. In doing this work, we will create a focal point for the study of African-American culture and history in Northeastern North Carolina and contribute to creating a much needed dense archive for the currently scattered history. In the process of doing, we hope to deepen and enhance relationships between ECSU and the communities it has touched during its 130 year history. We are just beginning the formal planning processes or planning stages for our future institute. This spring and summer using our IMLS grant, 
we will work with an architecture and design firm to create a comprehensive interpretive plan. This plan will allow us to design a space that will serve as a repository for artifacts and house interpretive exhibits, including a replica Rosenwald School classroom. We also intend for there to be research space in oral history and digital history laboratories, all geared towards supporting the Institute's mission. Ultimately, the Institute will welcome a broad and diverse public onto campus to learn about and to contribute to the documentation and preservation of the history of African American education in North Carolina. It will host speakers, conferences, and community events. Planned events include traveling exhibits, films, community history harvests. These activities will uh, draw local residents, school children on trips, African-American history enthusiasts, local and far-flung alumni, and thousands of people with connections to the university through its long reach as a normal school. The digitized archives created in the labs will spread knowledge of its holding across the state and beyond. The combined existence of the public gathering spaces and the research spaces will encourage both researchers and the general public to learn more about the histories of ECSU, Rosenwald schools and the region in both a virtual and uh, environment and in the physical space. ECSU is first, last and always a teaching institution and enhancing our students' educational experiences and career training opportunities will be Institute's mission. Toward this, the Institute's resources for research, uh, spaces for experiential learning and context for study will be of invaluable benefit to students and faculty in the humanities and other disciplines on, on campus. And I'm just gonna show you a few pictures that we've got um, or that I've got. You can see right here, this is our Rosenwald School, which is located on campus next to Viking Towers. And you can see that pull-up bar uh, that was used by our ROTC students in front of it. Uh, and then our principal is uh, facing, uh, street facing right now. Um, and here are some of the examples of some of the kinds of repairs that we'll be doing on the exterior. First, with our first park service grant, uh, which will also allow us to create architectural plans. And then we'll do some more kinds of uh, rehabilitation after we win additional grants uh, for the interior work. Um, here's just a few, including that South Mills uh, school that uh, Nyla mentioned that her grandmother attended. And obviously our intention is to go out into the community and have conversations for our CIP and also just for oral histories uh, where we talk to Rosenwald School alumni about what it is that they, uh, what their interests are uh, for this particular space as we're creating it. So we'll have meetings with alumni, we'll have meetings with students, we'll have meetings with faculty and staff and with our senior administrators to really develop a dream and an idea for what it is that we want our Rosenwald School to do and to be. And uh, like I mentioned earlier to um, Dr. Johnson that I just visited uh, a, the Camden County Heritage Museum and they you know, were really probably showing me their archives and the material is in acid free environments. So it's in, in uh, temperature sensitive environments. So it's more or less protected, but it's still material that is old and crumbling uh, that would benefit from digitization. So you can see here in one picture, the Camden County Board of Education's minutes. And this is exactly the kind of material that we're excited to have the opportunity to digitize in that Rosenwald School Lab to make it available for further study, believing that uh, the accessibility of primary resource materials makes it possible for us to better tell the story of our region and our state. And that's what we want to do. Uh, so that's really it. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Stuckey. Leo? Doc. Dr. Spence, staff, family, and friends of the library, good afternoon. In celebration of National Library Week, we are privileged to have our guest speaker, Dr. Asha Johnson. Dr. Asha Johnson is an educator and revelator of Southern intellectual history and an advocate for untold stories. She is committed to archival research, the production of minority librarians and archivists for cultural preservation and redefining the scholar. 
Dr. Johnson's stance on a soapbox for unveiling the history of underrepresented communities through the use of historical documents. She has, a fo she has focused much of her research on the developments of literacy in the African-American community and philanthropic efforts to develop public libraries in the South. Her advocacy for librarianship and archives is not only conveyed in her research, but also her professional career. She entered the information profession more than 10 years ago and has become experienced in program administration, evaluation, and development, as well as career development for an innovative instruction. With such a dedication to the field, Dr. Johnson encourages redefining the scholar. As an archival manager, she promoted her Breeding Scholars Initiative, which introduces high school and undergraduate college students to primary source research, placing emphasis on synthesis. Also, she is the author of the African American Struggle for Library Equality, the untold story of the Julius Rosenwald Fund Library Program. Dr. Johnson currently serves as an associate professor and program director of the Master of Library Science Program for the School of Library and Information Sciences at North Carolina Central University. She was dubbed the 2020 Distinguished Alumni of Florida State University School of Information, College of Communication and information. So without further preliminaries, it gives me a great pleasure to present my graduate instructor and advisor, who has become a great inspiration to me in my journey of becoming an archivist, Dr. Aisha Johnson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Thank you, Dr. Stuckey and Leah, uh, for having me this afternoon. I am more than honored to be here and super excited to hear about the Rosenwald project there that Dr. Stuckey is leading. Amazing work and I hope if I can be of any service to that project, please let me know. I, I'm always more than willing uh, to be of service. That's just kind of the nature of the beast, right? So I am uh, Dr. Aisha Johnson. I am, uh, yes, Assistant Professor and MLS Director for North Carolina Central University School of Library and Information Science. Uh, if you are uh, aware or you, you may not be, but let me inform you that uh, North Carolina Central University is the only HBCU uh, with a School of Library and Information Science program. That's not something that, you know, we want long term. We want to return when other HBCUs had library information science programs as well. But we'll talk about that. So uh, I am the author of the African American Struggle for Library Equality, the untold story of the Julius Rosenwald Library Program. And as you have already aware, as Nyla discussed about the Rosenwald program, uh, let's talk about a different aspect of that program, the program uh, that really uh, developed African American literacy uh, in the early 20th century, but not only African American literacy, the literacy of the entire American South ends up benefiting. So keep in mind that when we're focused on underrepresented, less seen and unheard groups that we actually help our entire society develop as a whole. So really, uh, with Southern Library development, keep in mind that our American education system is going to mirror that of the library systems as well. So while we're having library services a couple decades in advance uh, of the South, you know, we don't really have a, a record of library service to African Americans prior to 1900. We can look we can dig, myself, other scholars, these are not the records that we're finding. However, the North was producing uh, services specifically to African-Americans prior. But the South was really holding on to this, this illegal custom or this way of life uh, that is segregation, that is two failed reconstructions, that is the foundation uh, um, of, of systematic racism that we know is slavery. So the philanthropy for African-American institutions, especially in the South, is going to develop with the major assistance, not only of the community, 
but also charitable organizations and philanthropists. So as we know, or you're going to learn about uh, Julius Rosenwald, the fun library program, but there were other community philanthropists. Of course, we have, uh, you know, things, uh, developments like the Faith Cabin Libraries, and then we have uh, charitable organizations uh, like ALA, the American Library Association, the American Missionary Association, Gene Supervisors, uh, that are developing some form of library services in um, in the South. But the difference between that program and this program, among many differences, but the, the, the difference is we know of them. The difference is we are, we have been made aware through research of these programs. So that is my intention in producing this book. Our late great Toni Morrison said, if there's a book you want to read, but it has not been written, it is your job to write that book. So that is what I did. I, I took her charge. She is one of the, the uh, great admirations, great literary admirations of mine. And I take her charges along with uh, Mother Maya Angelou. And, you know, this is where we are. So let me discuss the Julius Rosenwald Fund a little bit more. So the Julius Rosenwald Fund really actually starts between 1917 and runs to about 1948 with some sporadic things happening there in the late 30s and the 40s. So there's four divisions within this program. Education, which includes library services, uh, health and medical services, fellowships and scholarships, as well as race relations, which we also know today as social studies. Now we have two key contributors, meaning namesakes, uh, shakers and movers, not the only, but two key contributors uh, in uh, library philanthropy. We all know of Andrew Carnegie, still giant, uh, likes his name on everything. Uh, but the problem we are going to have here is uh, the discrepancies in the amount of funding that he is giving uh, white libraries versus uh, quote unquote color or Negro uh, libraries uh, versus uh, Julius Rosenwald. Now Julius Rosenwald is a man who, <laughs> he doesn't want his name on anything. And this is why you do not know of Julius Rosenwald library program. There's many benefactors, but not many people who truly know with the exception of those who attended uh, the, the school. So like Nyla mentioned, you know, her grandparents. So if my, my grandparents or my great grandparents had the opportunity to attend school, my grandparents, your grandparents, great grands had the opportunity to attend school in the South in 15 Southern states, nine times out of 10, it was one one of those nearly uh, 5,400 Rosenwald schools. From 1917 to 1938, we actually produced 5,348 Rosenwald schools in 15 Southern states. This is often the only way African-Americans were able to actually access education in the South or formalized education in the South. So where does Julius Rosenwald come from? Because he's doing philanthropy, uh, you know, in the North, in Chicago. That's no problem. They're, they're very well aware of, of Julius Rosenwald and his philanthropy from the YMCA to the Chicago Museum and so on. Well, in the South, he's new to the South because a lot of his business was in the North. So on his 50th birthday, you know, uh, after reading up from slavery, he becomes awakened. He becomes uh, inspired and really he has this admiration for Booker T. Washington. And he wants to get involved. He wants to help Tuskegee the Institute, now university. He wants to help them. He wants to do something significant bigger with his money. And he wants to contribute towards the development of the African-American culture. So in 1912, on his 50th birthday, he gives Tuskegee Institute $25,000 uh, to work on the, the school, the property, the programs, et cetera. Well, there's a money remaining from that contribution. And Washington is the one who actually makes a suggestion to him that he allows him to utilize the money for one room schoolhouses around the university for the community. It is his love, trust, and admiration for Washington in which this program really sprawls into the monument for Black education that it is today. Uh, you know, so we get, again, about 5,400 schools from 1917 to 1932, and then we have a school uh, for 
Eleanor Roosevelt in Warm Springs, Georgia, randomly in 1936, because then Roosevelt was actually involved uh, in the development of literacy in library services. And then later on, uh, one thing you need to know about Roosevelt is all of his philanthropy is initially experimental. He wants to solve problems and expose African Americans to educational opportunities through literacy and his uh, the entire uh, theme method and, and purpose of the Julius Rosenwald Fund is the well being of mankind. How do you help mankind if you have those who are underrepresented, less seen and unheard? You focus on marginalized groups because marginalized groups will be how you develop your society as a whole. So ultimately, these are early efforts in equity, diversity, and inclusion in American uh, uh, culture. So the Rosenwald Library Program, the Fun Library Program, really comes about in 1927. Uh, and the goal here is to improve literacy and enhance educational opportunities, specifically for African Americans, not to say that he shut his services down to others, because Rosenwald, the, the, the main difference that makes him uh, a very unique philanthropist is that he didn't separate his money based on race. Julius Rosenwald has stipulations on uh, those who would qualify for his funding, but the number one stipulation was that all persons, black, white, urban and rural, had to be allowed to use that library, no matter whether it was a rural library, a school library as we know it today, or elementary school, uh, high school, college, HBCUs, and we'll talk about that, or, what we now call a public library than county library. It did not matter what type of library facility it was, because we have to remember that school libraries were initially the community libraries. See, there's this misconception that Black children cannot or do not read because their parents could not or did not read. I, I talk about it all the time. The thirst for literacy was always there, but access was not. So you can't make such uneducated misconceptions and put that on an entire culture and choose to hold a culture back by not providing the literary opportunities. There's a difference between reading, writing, and being information literate. Information literacy is about the ability to locate sort through, review, assess, and evaluate resources. It's not reading and writing. That is basic life skill. Information literate people are lifelong learners because they know how to learn. And Rosenwald understood this, you know, uh, and it actually was uh, uh, one of the officers who said to him, you know, these schools are wonderful. They're great, but they're mute without the proper library material. And that is really the, the start of the library program. When he becomes aware that we need consistent and access to materials. That is how you continuously grow. That is how you grow literacy. Beyond reading and writing, it's access. So we have a number of libraries and in libraries we're talking about not only the physical facility, but the collections themselves. Uh, we are, are addressing more than 9,400 rural schools, uh, also 43 African-American colleges and normal schools. We'll talk about that. That is pretty interesting, starting off as many teacher training colleges and normal schools. And then the 11 counties within seven Southern states that participated in a county-wide library demonstration. So the rural school starts off with 10 library sets in the participating, the qualified participating Southern states. Uh, we educate the principal, the teachers. We talk to the students about what we know today is reader advisory services. We see a consistent addition of new books, which is also known as collection development today based on the information needs and information seeking behaviors of our constituents, our patrons, our customers. You know, we are also providing services to the community. Remember that misconception, that gross misconception that Black children couldn't or did not read. 
We were, did, we're continuously disproving that matter throughout this entire program because there's actually statistics that will show in the record that when a book is taken home by one student, at least another five members within that house and in that community is reading that book. So we're not, there's not a lack of thirst for literacy. There's a lack of access, and, and, and that is the confusion, but it was a, a welcomed confusion. It was an accepted confusion, not for the African American culture, but for white culture, because there's this secondary misconception that says any Black institution and the development of said institution must significantly lag behind that of whites. It's in, it's in the records. Intentionally and impactfully, something that still to this day affects not only our culture, but also our profession. Those foundations, I like to, to, to put out there that, dare I say, the, the American Library is one of the places that we perfected systematic racism. Because where you hold a culture's literacy in the palm of your hand, tightly closed, you are also holding their growth and development. Now, what you'll also see throughout the records and throughout the books that I, I throughout the book that I discuss is the annual reports. And that's one of the greatest things that the Rosenwald Fund required. No matter what type of library facility it was, everyone was indeed required to either give annual or quarterly reports. Now, the African American colleges, normal schools, the institutes was actually deemed the most successful division. Now, this is significant. And this is really where I start talking about a design, a disadvantage by design. So many of our HBCUs, as we know, started off as teacher training colleges and normal schools. But these teacher training colleges did not have the proper children's literature. How, how, how do we educate teachers to go out in the communities and, and, and be the best instructors and inspiring instructors that they can be without the proper children's literature library at their training institute? Furthermore, a lot of these HBCUs were not accredited along with the high schools because they did not have the proper library. Understand that accreditation and your library, your, my, my, my tag of the, the library is the soul of the schoolhouse is I got this out of the collection. The reality of it is the library can make or break your accreditation. Not only the facility, but the number of professionals that you have but nobody's actually offering formal training to African-Americans to become librarians. It's a disadvantage by design. Without the African-American colleges and the high schools uh, having that accreditation, tell me, how am I as a student coming from an unaccredited high school supposed to get into an accredited college? How am I, as a new graduate of an unaccredited college, supposed to get a viable job? How's that possible? This was not foreign. You know, th this is something the state departments of education were very well aware of. And let me be clear that the federal department of education is still fairly young. It just came about in the late 70s. It's still very young. So we are relying on the state departments of education in the rural segregated South to do something they're not really going to do blatantly, outright, disrespectfully, openly. So with these, with the program, we're actually seeing high schools being accredited. We're actually seeing uh, African American colleges get accreditation because they're now properly equipped. And then also within the high schools, we're seeing the library is placed, the concept that we hold so near and dear, actually developed way earlier than literature suggests. So here in the high schools is where the Rosenwald Fund Library Program starts really focusing on the facility, 
you know, the lighting, the, the furniture, the, the, you know, the, the, and the furniture from the comfort of the chairs to the tables and the layout and the environment, the temperature controls. There's three, uh, 10 things that they automatically check off. And when I read that, I was like, this is Liberia's place. You know, we're looking at the, the cultural, the recreational aspects of the library. So a lot of concepts that we, you know, down to the reference interview that we take secondhand today as professionals, they're developed way earlier than presented. And then there, of course, is the county library demonstration. The county library demonstration called for those states to have legislation that supported library services. So many states did not qualify, but seven states and 11 counties within uh, those states did qualify. And now this is about the development of proper library services, reference services, but also programming. Now pay attention to these states' names. Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, the Carolinas, Tennessee, and Texas. You're in the South. You know the history of these states. They are historically some of the most bloodiest states when it comes to African-American or violence against African-Americans. Well, let me tell you something about this county library demonstration. Rosenwald still had a stipulation that whether it was black or white, rural, urban, everyone in that county had to be allowed to use that library or he, they were not getting his money. It was a strong stipulation and it was enforced. So keep in mind that not only are we missing an entire narrative, but we're missing a history here. And these small rural counties that were historically segregated, they desegregated 1929 for county library service. 1929, we're missing that history of Black and white people were together in libraries, reading books, reading rooms, simply for access. Now we have to ask what happened. Because somewhere between uh, 1936 and the civil rights movement, we go back. Now, mind you, all of Rosenwald's contributions, all of his experiments, you know, that first year and then going on for another couple of years, be mindful that he wanted it to cut off at a certain point because he wanted the system to be influenced that they took over or the county library was able to be self-reliant. He didn't want his fund to exist in perpetuity. He didn't want his fund to exist long-term. So like Rockefeller or the Roosevelt's, he didn't want that. He wanted to have an impact that would influence and inspire others to get involved and invest in the African-American culture, specifically in African-American education. So the county library demonstration is really about rendering those reference services that we hold really dear today. But also we see a regular circulation of books, we see pay collections, and we see special programming, which is really about outreach, marketing, and advocating for the library. So we're going to have educational programs, adult education programs, more formally known as uh, GED programs today, musical and dramatic uh, organizations, exhibits, circulations of images, slides, uh, moving scores and phonographic records. And the beauty in this particular one, we go from annual to quarterly reports. And these quarterly reports break down white circulation and black circulation. And I will tell you in those records, you will see the thirst on both sides, but you will see the thirst for access, the thirst for literacy. You will see the myth that Black children could not or did not read based on these statistics, because they were reading heavily. And when there is a consistent addition of books, not only do we have collection development, we have reading encouragement throughout this entire program. Now, the practices, of course, of other non-Rosenwald libraries, we have to understand that everything Rosenwald did, he didn't want to do by himself. But if he had to, such as the HBCU division, he did. 
So he wanted to influence those libraries who could not meet those stipulations, who did not qualify. So he made those library sets available, those library collections available. He provided professional training of exemplary teachers and librarians. And of course, cooperative studies of regional problems, AKA race relations today, known as social studies. So whenever you are doing archival research, any kind of research, of course you have your research inquiries naturally, but I always encourage people to stay open to archival records, stay open. Because if you're not, you'll answer your question and miss all the gems. And I'm glad that I stayed open because I was able to find out so much more that probably created a lifetime research agenda. Catch 22. You know, uh, we talk about state library commissions, library schools, scholarships and fellowships for the fund, training institutes and meetings for Negro African American librarians, extended library services to uh, cities that were heavily populated, you know, uh, by African Americans and libraries for military servicemen because we are indeed gonna cross a time of war where uh, servicemen are now leaving home for the first time and have never been any around anyone that didn't look like them, black and white. So this is ultimately a race relations collection that is documenting and includes books uh, of the African-American contributions to American society. Now let's talk about standardizing black librarianship. Rosenwald's commitment, hands down, to literacy evolved our profession. Now we still have work to do, but from where we were in 1930, focused on African-American literacy meant that we needed African-American librarians and formally trained African-American librarians to service the communities. Because we know about that library anxiety. We know about having being serviced by someone who does not look like you when we're talking about literacy. When you are illiterate, you are not knowing. And that is a place of vulnerability. And there's comfort in someone who looks like you when you're seeking help. Uh, Alfreda, Alfreda Chapman's theory, life in the round. People are seeking information within their circle because they trust their circle. So representation is beyond checking boxes. Representation, equity, diversity, and inclusion is about servicing all people adequately. So with the library schools, Julius Rosenwald and the ALA kind of have this chicken or the egg debate, right? They have this debate, uh, do we give the librarian or the library facility first? And ALA and, and Rosenwald decide that we need to do this together. We need to uh, create Hampton Institute 1925 to 1939 and also send exemplary teachers from those five uh, uh, HBCUs, those, those initial HBCUs to Hampton for a year of training. When they returned, they had their library facility that was adequately uh, stocked with appropriate literature of all types of genres, you know? Uh, and we see a number of financial contributions to Hampton, North Carolina, uh, Emory, and these are for library schools. 43 HBCUs uh, received funding in some way, shape or form, including Elizabeth City State, uh, received funding in some way, shape or form from the Rosenwald Fund. And many of them are not actually aware that they have a library on their campus that was funded by the Rosenwald Fund. I've made you know, Fisk University aware of this. And, and the reason many don't know is because there's a historical plaque and it may have somebody else's name on it. So for example, at Fisk University, Carnegie's name was on that plaque. He did contribute some money, but nowhere near the $100,000 that Rosenwald did in 1930. Why? Rosenwald did not want his name because for him, it was about his Jewish heritage. It was about something bigger than him. And the highest level of Jewish charitable giving is anonymous on both ways. The recipient doesn't know the giver, the giver, the, it, nobody knows. That keeps it authentic, that keeps it genuine, and that keeps it intentional. 
However, we weren't able to give Rosenwald his appropriate flowers. Now we are, and with the family's blessing, I write things about Rosenwald. So we can know about the library schools. So we can know that at some point, and, and we gotta figure this out because at some point there was many HBCUs that had library science programs. I talk about North Carolina being the only library science program at an HBCU, not as a feather in our hat, but as an inquiry to say, we need to find out what happened. FAMU, FIS, Tennessee State, Prairie View, among others. You know of Hampton, you know of Clark, you know of North Carolina Central. But what happened to all those other HBCUs that had library science programs in the 30s? We need to, we need to find that out because we're missing a piece that is going to uh, greatly assist in our efforts for representation in our efforts for uh, African-American librarians, Hispanic librarians, because we're not the only people that attend historically Black colleges and universities. We're not. So if we're gonna talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion and real representation, we have to talk about our educational programs. We have to talk about recruitment. We have to talk about retention. We have to talk about mentoring. We can't just look at the problem as a surface level problem when the roots are way deeper. So it's on our profession and our professional organizations to really do something. So there was other force forces within this program, scholarships and fellowships. If you are aware, I'm pretty sure you're aware of the wonderful Vivian Harsh who you know, was a recipient of the program. Arna Bontops was a recipient of the, you know, the fellowships for library administration, promising men and women to be administrators, black administrators in libraries. There is a focus on the development of library services, cultural library services to minority groups as well. And then we have a number of training institutes and meetings that a number of, of, of our uh, veteran librarians and library administrators actually experience, such as, you know, uh, training institutes at Atlanta University, now known as Clark Atlanta. Congress, uh, conferences for Negro librarians at this, there was two in 29 and as well as 1930. And then the Southeastern Library Association Summer Institutes for teacher librarians. Oftentimes librarians were what we call exemplary teachers who were trained to be librarians. Because before Hampton, and of course the, the, the Polytech in Louisville, there is no formalized training. That was more of a certificate in training program, but before Hampton, there was no formalized training intentionally. Because it's not to say that we didn't have library schools such as the Carnegie Library School in Atlanta, 1905 to 1925. They just weren't training anybody but white men intentionally because that is how they felt the work needed to be done. See, we have to understand that libraries are a privilege. Today, we walk in, think nothing of it. Even at an HBCU, we walk in the facility and we think nothing of it because it has always been there for us, but it hasn't always been there for others. So we have to think about the impact and we really have to dig into it and understand how those uh, that impact is still implicating, uh, causing us uh, issues today. Again, not only within practice and services, but also within the profession and the lack of diversity within our profession. So what's next is looking at this disadvantage by design looking at those HBCUs and those library science programs and having hard conversations about not only what happened, looking in those archives, looking at what happened, looking at recruitment, retention curriculum, looking at funding of those programs, but also looking at matters of politics, looking at matters of desegregation, 
that really hurt the HBCU. Looking at matters of, you know, state policies because you can't have competing programs. A lot of schools were, you know, consolidated. So we missed out. So of course, we also have to look at our curriculum that we're teaching within the SLIS programs. We have to promote libraries and access to libraries as a social justice initiative for equity, diversity, inclusion, and of course, representation. Thank you all. Thank you all for having me. I'll take questions, um, the comment. I think David's going to facilitate. All right. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. We do have a question from one of our faculty members, Dr. Stevenson, who asks to uh, please speak to the connection between the lack of traditional literacy and the lack of political and economic literacy within those Black communities, which still exist in not so indirect ways today. Uh, you're, there we you're go. Muted, Dr. Johnson. Uh, so we have to have the necessary exposure for those conversations and kind of be open to them. Traditionally, uh, well, non-traditionally, African Americans have not always been democratic. We also have to understand that the Republican and Democratic parties did indeed change over time. And, and the parties that we know today are not the parties that originally existed. Uh, but that is a matter of us, I think we're doing a better job at it now, especially during uh, our last administration through the pandemic and now our current administration and the changes uh, between say uh, President Obama and our current administration that, that has happened. I think now we're becoming um, politically aware and more importantly, more politically involved. So uh, not only are our generation, but the younger generation is also taking on a charge, which is a different uh, social movement that kind of got united with Black Lives Matter. Uh, but it is a different social movement of uh, Black political awareness, but not just Blacks, but marginalized groups as well. Can I ask a question? All right. Go okay. ahead. Okay, um, Dr. Johnson, first of all, I would like to say the congratulations, awesome presentation. Um, would, I would like to um, know more about your opinions about collection development. Um, and you, you talk about the disadvantage by design and um, unfortunately, you know, the, the problem is, um, or the, the question I should say, the attracting um, young readers, young generation of African-Americans, how can we achieve that? Most of the collection in other libraries are based on user on demand. Mm -hmm. Do you suggest, um, you know, it's, it's a vice versa thing and double-sided double sword. Mm -hmm. If the users don't demand, hey, no one is using it, maybe we should we shouldn't buy it that's the understanding one side of collection development mm -hmm. and how do you what's your approach on that okay so so two parts one um attracting young readers i'll be very honest with you uh, readers young readers are developed at home young readers are developed at home very early on in life um and if they're not developed at home they're developed at the school library at the elementary Oftentimes, the school library itself is the initial library that uh, children are introduced to. I still remember my school librarian today, but my parents took me to the library when I was younger. We had a library at, at home. You know, they, they noticed that I enjoyed reading and they would buy me books and encyclopedia. I was not that child that you brought toys, you know, uh, for Christmas or anything like that. You brought me books. You know, uh, so so one we have to really infuse the and we have to really infuse into parents to not leave it to the educational system to uh, turn our children into readers, because the way that the educational system the programs are chopped, you cannot rely on that. Education is also at home. 
And then of course, you know, again, supporting our school libraries. Now the other part on collection development, there's two ways to do collection development, systematically and on demand. And of course, this is all going to depend on your budget, right? Um, that, and then I know in a pandemic, we are operating on like shoestring budget, meaning what is necessary only. Uh, so there, there's a catch 22 there, but post pandemic, when we get back <laughs> to some kind of normalcy, uh, we will definitely start probably more systematic collection development, meaning, uh, you know, looking at the things that would attract young readers. Now on demand is fine if you kind of have that cushion in your, your belt, but also on demand is more so uh, great for faculty support as well. So there's a there's a two prong situation there, and quite honestly, it will depend on your budget. With systematic collection development, I always recommend that there's not just one person doing collection development, but more so a team. There's a checks and balances system in that, uh, but also there are different perspectives uh, available as well. I think I saw. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. No problem. Uh, yes, we do have one other question from uh, looks like. VL price. I, the uh, person who asked a question should be able to unmute themselves. Um, if not, oh, they said uh, they don't have a question. <laughs> okay, Do you have any other questions up. from uh, the audience? <laughs> any other questions from the audience or panelists? All right, well, uh, if not, then that concludes our National Library Week speaker event. Thank you very much for uh, speaking to us. They do have another question. I believe Jamila Scott Brandt raised her hand. Oh, there we go. So we Good did. afternoon, everyone. Um, oh. This was a phenomenal program. I am the Assistant Director of Library Services at North Carolina Central University. And my question, and I get this question all the time, and I, I, I love the way you um, phrase the um, design, I'm disadvantaged by design. Mm -hmm. And I get questions all the time at different on different diversity committees and, and folks are constantly asking, what can we do now, especially since um, there's a need for more diversity and inclusion within the profession. We have a, pro a profession that's still predominantly white mm -hmm. and people are still asking the same question. What can we do to help diversify the field um, of library sciences, science. So do you have uh, um, any thoughts on what can be done? Cause that's a popular question that, that no one seems to have an answer to. Well, I got two answers <laughs> uh, for that question. Um, honestly, uh, one, talk to young black, uh, the generation. Because again, I mean, North Carolina Central is the only program and we are online, but, and I, I say it all the time, we can't take on the whole thing by ourselves and we're not supposed to. This is a cultural matter. This is something that we have to do uh, as a unit, as all black librarians, because we know the importance of literacy uh, to our culture and the impact, the long-term impact, not only for that current generation, but generations to come. So we have to take this on as, uh, as a, a collaborative effort. You know, not only do we have to expose and talk to as professionals, talk to our students about, you know, the work that we're doing, librarianship. A lot of people don't know librarians have master degrees. That's our terminal degree. A lot of people do not know that. And I mean, how would they? Because we're a group of introverts and we don't talk to people outside of ourselves. <laughs> so that's a problem. <laughs> and the other portion to that is getting involved. Getting involved in ALA, getting involved in SAA, getting involved in a lease, especially us with these PhDs, getting involved in a lease. Get on your soapbox and be relentless. I'm pretty sure people already know when they see me coming. I'm on my soapbox. I'm advocating for HBCU libraries. I'm advocating for NCCU SLIS program. I'm advocating for all things EDI and representation. There's no guessing on what I'm coming to talk to you about. I will advocate it till the sun is down and we can still talk some more. But that is really, it, it's, it's two parts. It's about us as a culture and, and, and as Black professionals and exposing people not only 
to libraries, but libraries, archives, and museums, because remember, archives and museums have the narrative. And they push forth the narrative, while libraries are focused on literacy. So it's not just libraries, it's Black professionals within LAMS, libraries, archives, and museums, and then also getting involved. Mm -hmm. I find that if we can get involved, not only at the service level, but the admin level, you know where the decisions are being made, mm -hmm. it makes a significant difference. Yeah, I also agree with you uh, very much so with that, uh, Dr. Johnson. I know when we have student workers, and that's a contact for us, mm -hmm. we have student workers to join us for work study. We talk about uh, going into the professional library and information science. Because Absolutely. they don't, a lot of students don't know, they don't realize, like you say, it's a professional, it's our yeah. term of degree. And so that is one way I do when I get with student workers, I always let them know about the profession. And we have actually had students to want to go in the profession just from coming to us with right. our work study. Right, absolutely. It's, it's it's one of those things. I mean, we've all came to librarianship like that. Is it, you know, quite honestly, we all just was exposed. That that's the only way you learn about the profession is exposure. And it's just like naturally, we attract people who love to read and, and love to help you and, and want to help you grow. And then there's this epiphany. One a part of my teaching philosophy is I love to be the vehicle of someone's epiphany. That's like definition librarian, okay? <laughs> That is definition librarian and there's people we are innately born this way. So it's a matter of the library profession will naturally find you, but we got to do a better job at finding uh, uh, marginalized people. We really do. Okay. Um, Dr. Stuckey, I think you wanted to speak. Yeah, so I have a question about how we, uh, you know, we were primarily undergraduate teaching institution. Um, and I, I'll be honest, uh, you know, we talk about different careers for his history majors in particular, and I don't think on our little list we have library. So can you tell us some of the uh, majors that are um, that are gateway majors to MLS programs? Um, quite honestly, any one of them. The wonderful thing about uh, librarianship, I always call it a warm blanket. The beautiful thing about librarianship is you can put it on any profession and it makes it better. Mm -hmm. And that's just the reality of the situation, because see, the thing is, there is not a single profession, career, trade, or anything that you will do to produce income that doesn't require literacy. There isn't one. Everyone needs literacy. So, and that's the beauty of it, because think about it, we have all kinds of specializations. We have everybody, a liaison, subject specialist, whatever. If there's an academic program within our institution, we have a subject specialist or liaison for it. You know why? Because literacy is a necessity for everyone. So we really need to be exposing. That's why I said we got to start talking to people outside of ourselves, because we can talk to each other about this all day. But the reality of it is we know Others don't. So we need to go outside of us, you know, and, and, and this is one of the reasons I really love this work in this, this piece, because not only does it fill a gap for libraries, museums and archives, but it fills a gap in American education and history and exposes people to the opportunity to be a librarian, to be an archivist, to be a museum curator, because at the end of the day, all of those career paths matter to uh, having a complete and accurate narrative for marginalized groups. And just to piggyback on that, are there particular kinds of experiences that you would be looking for in an applicant? Um, I know Dr. Spence mentioned work study students, but in addition to that, are there other kinds of things that you might, that a student might want to, you know, try to get in the summertime or something? Want to help people grow, to be honest with you. I mean, it's, it's, if you ever watch a librarian help someone and they get the resource that that person needs, you will see a sheer piece of happiness in that person. And just that easy desire, that simple desire to want to help someone, that's it. You can, you can go intern at an archive museum. You can do virtual services. Now, you know, the reference services since the pandemic, we're doing virtual. You can work, do work study in a, um, in a library. Uh, it, it, trust me nobody's gonna turn you away 
nobody's going to turn you away because anytime we can bring more people into this profession, we just be the happiest little campers. <laughs> We're just happy, happy people, student internships, talking to people who are actively in the profession, um, not to say that retirees don't have something to offer because they can give you a historical perspective that you can't buy, uh, uh, but also uh, just looking into things. Anytime you walk into a public college, whatever type of library, people will be willing to talk to you about the career option. But we gotta do a better job at exposing ourselves. We really do. Okay, are there other questions? If, if there are no- uh, other questions. Velma Blackman asks, uh, what are the roles of university archives in doing research on the philanthropy of Rosenwald, Carnegie, Vanderbilt at all? So you definitely have to, uh, of course, locate. Now there's there there's a you have to be able to locate the collections, and that's pretty easy with the level of technology that we have today. But also talking to those archives or those archivists about uh, any collections that are possibly not currently uh, accessible, and looking at collaborations, partnerships, and grants uh, to have those collections processed and made available uh, to researchers as well. Uh, so the role in archives is the same thing. You know, when I talk to to my groups of archivists, this is the beauty of the work that they do. Because this collection had been sitting there, uh, the primary, not the Rosenwald Fund archives, that collection's processed and available, but the SL Smith archives uh, had been sitting at Fisk University, uh, and, and no shade to them because most archives, all archives have backlogs, um, have been sitting there since, you know, about 1950, and I processed it in 2011. You know, there's a lot of collections at HBCU archives that are just hidden gems. I mean, they are holding American history and impactful history. And you know, the role of archives is not only are we preserving and processing those papers, but we're making them available. But we also have to get more people, you know, working as archivists because archives, no matter the profession, no matter the facility, are historically also understaffed. So we got to get in those professions as well. Yeah. Okay. Can I say? something also yes a um, couple of things first uh, you wanted you mentioned to a wonderful point getting out of the circle and I am advocate of that being more international uh, raising your culture awareness of your culture yes. to um, the international platforms mm -hmm. um, first question how what are your suggestions to achieve that goal and second question is, um, how can we advocate the, um, our um, archive, archive here? We have a hidden archive here. How can we advocate and persuade upper management, make sure that we have enough support because we are under resource, unfortunately, is the yeah. you know destiny destiny of all of the HBCUs out there. Right. Um, we don't have an archive in in a national in parentheses, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, we are still working on that because of COVID, of course, of course. it's frozen. Um, but um, we want, you know, we want to advocate that position. What is your suggestion to, you know, better approach the upper management to make sure that we, appro we advocate mm -hmm. that? And then uh, I'm sorry for putting the last minute question. And, and then oh, my third question would be, um, the hidden archives that you just mentioned that's a problem mm -hmm. how would we make sure that we have the necessary uh, support technical everything that we can make sure that these archives are not hidden anymore and right. it's, it belongs to the public right and the answer really is uh, the answer yeah. is really two parts one on the international piece because i completely understand that i teach my foundation students a lot about international uh, uh librarianship we also have courses in comparative and global librarianship as well and that international piece is definitely a gap within our profession uh, or at least within american librarianship i'll say uh and that is about getting involved american library association has a section for international global librarians they're really great about, you know, having representation for all types of groups of people, uh, whether it's race, uh, geographic location, gender identity, whatever the situation is, ALA as an organization is really great about making sure you have a place and a platform. 
So it is up to, to us in our respective groups to utilize that platform. Now, the second and third question is really about advocacy and grant writing. And those are e now advocacy, because you can talk about the library all day, every day. Grant writing is a little bit more complicated. It takes up a lot more time. But that grant writing piece is where, especially for HBCUs, grant writing is a matter of survival. You know, uh, because we are historically underfunded, not only because, you know, our separation between church and state for our private HBCUs, uh, but also because even when you're a state organization, you're a state institution, you're still underfunded. You know, uh, so again, disadvantaged by design. So we have to pick up our slack that was given to us. We have to do a lot of grant writing. There's a, a number of granting organizations, IMLS, NEH. Uh, there is, especially NEH, uh, actually they have a deadline coming up for um, um, HBCU faculty. They have grants for individual HBCU faculties. Uh, CLEAR, the Council of Librarian and Information Resources have uh, uh, grants specifically for hidden collections. And they are very much so about digitization and very much so about those hidden narratives of, uh, historically marginalized groups. So there's many granting agencies out there uh, carrying on our regular load and grant writing. I'm not going to act like that's something simple. It's not. But is it necessary to our survival? Absolutely. Absolutely. So and, and advocacy all day, every day. Advocacy and awareness is the way of survival. Great questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson, for that great information. Um, we run over a bit on time. Um, so unless we have any last minute questions, I believe this uh, concludes our presentation. Um, so thank you very much to Dr. Johnson, uh, Dr. Stuckey, and all of our other speakers today. Thank you for yeah. having me. It, it, it was my absolute pleasure. Thank yes, you so most much. Most definitely. Thank you so very much, Dr. And let me know if I can be of assistance on that, that project, Dr. Stuckey and Dr. Spence. Please do. I, that may be a collaboration. We're right in Durham. Thank you so very much. I would like to thank both of you, Dr. Stuckey, Dr. Johnson, Neil, um, and David. Uh, I also would like to thank, uh, thank the audience for attending today. Thank you. You thank all have you. a great yes. day. And thank you, Leah. Y'all have a wonderful day and be All safe. Right, you do the same, be safe.